Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, go through a bunch of examples of how we have tried to use policy to promote health in New York City. And first, though, and then at the end, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish some thoughts about the, the role of research and researchers in uh, policy uh, efforts to promote health. First, though, I want to say, <laughs> how do we decide what our targets are for health promotion through policy? And uh, because it's a lot of work to do health promotion through policy, and uh, uh, many political fights involved. So we have to set priorities. Um, and we set our priorities pretty much according to data like this. This is data where we took a, a national, uh, or actually a global analysis, uh, where they tried to estimate how many deaths different risk factors caused. And we applied it to New York City data. And uh, it's not a perfect way of looking at the data, because there's certain risk factors that you really couldn't measure this way. But it does give you a sense for which of the um, of the different uh, behaviors and exposures um, of those that they could measure are responsible for the most deaths. Um, and by this measure, smoking causes more deaths in New York City than anything else. If you look on down the list, uh, you see overweight, obesity next, high blood pressure, high blood glucose. Um, an awful lot here are related to diet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so unhealthy diet would be, as a category, number two here. Then you also see physical inactivity here at number five and alcohol use a little bit further down the list. So those are the areas that I consider to be ripe for policy-based approaches for health promotion. So uh, I'm going to talk about things we've done on smoking, and then I'm going to go on to what we've done on diet. Uh, what have we done on smoking? Well, uh, one of the, the biggest things, and I think the, the most effective things, has been our smoke-free air policies. In 2002, the city passed, uh, with, under the mayor's leadership, uh, Smoke-Free Air Act, which banned smoking in workplaces, including restaurants and bars. Uh, at this time, <coughs> excuse me, that was the most comprehensive um, Smoke-Free Air Act of a city. I believe California had banned it in bars at the time. But it was a pretty radical act at the time, um, and it was very effective, controversial. Uh, in 2011, we extended <coughs> to outdoor parks and beaches. And in 2012, uh, we've now made progress in institutional policy where the City University of New York, which has 23 campuses in the city, will make all of their campuses entirely tobacco free. We've also increased the price of cigarettes through taxes. Um, in 2000, a total tax on a pack of cigarettes in New York City <coughs> excuse me, was about $1.50, with uh, big increases in tax at the local level and state level and some increases at the federal level. Total tax on a pack of cigarettes in New York City now is $6.86, which means if you go down to a bodega in New York City to buy a pack of cigarettes, the price would be about $11, which would be the highest price in the nation. We have also passed a rule which was a success from a health promotion standpoint and a failure from a legal standpoint. Uh, this was our, our tobacco warning sign rule. It was passed in the Board of Health, which is a, a body we have, uh, we're fortunate to have that can make rules within the health domain uh, <coughs> that, excuse me, that have the force of law. <coughs> and this, what the law required was that any retailer who was selling cigarettes would have to post a warning sign designed by the health department uh, that looked like this, but that could rotate over time uh, within proximity to where they were selling their cigarettes in the store. And here's what happened to that. The, we were immediately sued by the tobacco companies, um, and a U.S. District Court struck it down. They said that it was preempted by the, the new federal law, the Federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act. Um, and I don't fully understand the legal argument behind it, but they said that because we tied the warning signs to where the cigarettes were promoted, that, that we were preempted. Um, that was uh, brought up to an appeals court, and we, uh, we lost in the appeals court as well. But in the, in the, uh, the ruling, they did recognize that the local government did have the authority to regulate the time, place, and manner of promotion of cigarettes. So that there is uh, an opportunity in there, I think, for some additional work that can be done at the retail level around tobacco that has now been affirmed by the appeals court. So possibly a potential victory in the future around this loss. We did, though. Uh, the signs were used by a number of stores while the court cases were proceeding, and we had an opportunity to evaluate it. And so we surveyed people as they exited stores uh, before the signs went up, and then again afterwards. And this is just some of the survey data that came out of it. You see beforehand, 30% of people saw signs that 
were not there, um, which happens if you ask people these sorts of things, what have you seen? But afterwards, it was 67%. So a fairly good size, size proportion of people did, <coughs> did see those signs. The percentage of people who said that the, the warning signs made them think about the, the risk of smoking a lot, or made them think about quitting a lot, jumped pretty substantially. The percent of people who said that they uh, did not buy a pack of cigarettes as a result of that sign did not increase at all. So it didn't affect their immediate purchase, but we think it had benefit over the long term in making people think about quitting. So from our perspective, it was, again, success from a public health standpoint, but it, it failed in the courts. Now, around the same time, a law was passed in the New York City Council uh, that filled a little niche, uh, a little gap in the law, where the, the federal law made it illegal to sell flavored cigarettes, with the exception of menthol, but the, uh, there were still other tobacco products, not cigarettes, that could be sold that had flavoring in them. And there were cigars and other tobacco products that had flavorings like strawberry and chocolate, uh, which would tend to entice youth, youth into uh, starting up with tobacco. Uh, and so the council banned their sale in New York City. Uh, this also was um, challenged in court, uh, and as of November 2011, the district court upheld the ban, said it wasn't preempted, um, and it made a comment that states and localities may pr promote, impose restrictions on the sale of certain subclasses of tobacco products. So there may be some opportunities that come out of this, uh, this case law as well. It's been appealed. It's under the appeals court. We're still waiting for the ultimate ruling there. So um, <coughs> some of the things we're doing about smoking, what about diet now. Let's talk about trans fat. The um, uh, trans fat, first, uh, uh, we've done things on trans fat, and this is the rationale for it. It was, uh, as, as much as we're all familiar with margarine and think of it as being fairly uh, innocuous, it is in fact an artificial chemical that is a, a, a created through a very uh, complicated industrial process that involves extremely high temperatures that leads to a um, thing called partial hydrogenation. Uh, and uh, evidence over the last 20 years has shown that it increases your LDL cholesterol, that lowers your HDL cholesterol, and that the um, response is fairly <coughs> um, apparent at relatively small doses. So even the amount of um, trans fat that you get in a single um, uh, amount of french fries uh, taken daily would increase your heart disease risk by about 23%. Now trans fat had an advantage that because it was an artificial chemical, it was totally unnecessary. The substitutes were available. And so because of this, we thought it should simply be banned. And because we had the Board of Health, which regulates restaurants in New York City, uh, we had the opportunity to do this. So in 2006, the Board of Health voted to just simply say restaurants <coughs> could not use trans fat in their own cooking. They could sell products that were already packaged that had trans fat in them. So a, um, a muffin that was they purchased from somewhere else in its packaging they could sell. But they couldn't use trans fat in making their french fries or, or baking their goods in the restaurant. The, uh, despite the fact that the industry said that this would be impossible to implement uh, and it was greatly criticized and ridiculed, um, it was uh, actually it was not challenged in court. Uh, it proved to be very easy for our industry to implement. Uh, we gave it an extra year for um, restaurants that did deep frying of donuts that said that they needed to work out a little more about how they would, uh, what their deep fry oils were. Uh, but um, within two years, more than 90% of restaurants are in compliance uh, and it's been a great success. Uh, but this was an example of some of the press that we got uh, when the, the trans fat ban first went through. Um, green carts is uh, uh, another one uh, that is maybe distinct in New York City, but it is an interesting example of how um, we have used policy to promote health. The, um, there are street vendors in New York City that sell food. And uh, over the years, uh, people have criticized the street vendors and it's been uh, litigated by whether you can sell food in, this, in the uh, city. And the, the litigation has led to the, to the ruling that uh, selling on the street is a constitutionally protected activity. The city can regulate it, but it cannot prohibit it. And so as part of the regulations in the city, there is a cap on the total number of uh, uh, outlets, the number of carts that can sell food on the street in New York City. Uh, what we did was saw an opportunity that if we raise that cap, uh, but cert place certain restrictions on that, um, on the increased numbers, we could increase access to fruits and vegetables in a way that would not cost the city any money because there's a great demand for the permits to sell uh, food on the street far, far in excess of the number of permits. So the green card rule was a rule that was passed in 2008. Uh, it established 1,000 new permits in New York City, uh, but only if people sold only raw fruits and vegetables. 
and only if they sold them in neighborhoods that we designated as being underserved, as measured by having high rates of obesity and diabetes and low amounts of fruit and vegetable consumption. Now, um, it's hard to make a living in those neighborhoods selling fruits and vegetables. And so although we permitted 1,000, we made available 1,000 permits, only about 500 of them have issued. Uh, and on a given day, about half of those are actually in operation. Nonetheless, that means that there's about 250 new outlets for fruit and vegetables sales in underserved neighborhoods uh, in New York City at no cost to the city. So let's move on to calorie labeling. Um, the rationale for this is that consumers grossly underestimate the amount of calories in the food that they eat. Uh, first of all, people can't estimate how much fat is in an item, and that is what often uh, very much tends to drive the calorie count. Um, and also, there is a, just a tendency to underestimate what to, how many calories are in any item. So this is an example from uh, one study that was done before we put in place the calorie rule. It showed that people were estimating something to be maybe 600 calories when it was maybe 1,800 calories, so uh, way, way off. Uh, and so um, in the, the legal landscape, when we looked at this in the, uh, in the early 2000s was uh, uh, based upon the federal law, the National Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, which that's what creates the nutrition labels on packaged food, but it explicitly exempts restaurants. So restaurants don't have to put a nutrition facts panel on the food that they sell you. Uh, and the New York City Board of Health regulates restaurants. So uh, we passed a rule through the Board of Health in 2006, which required calorie labeling at chain restaurants. And the reason we restricted it to chains was that they have very standardized recipes and standardized menus, and so that it's feasible for them, whereas it's much more complicated for an independent restaurant to do this. Uh, we were sued uh, by the New York State Restaurant Association. Uh, we lost the first round of suits. We changed the rule based upon the judge's ruling. Um, we sued again, uh, and we ended up uh, winning the second round of suits. Um, and by 2008, we had calorie labeling in New York City. And then in 2009, uh, after um, Seattle and I, <coughs> I think maybe another jurisdiction or two had passed similar rules, the restaurant industry was concerned about having multiple different formats in different parts of the country. And so they agreed to have calorie labeling be included in the Affordable Care Act. So calorie labeling should be going national. Uh, it's, it's in the law, but it's taken a long time for the FDA to, to uh, promulgate the rules around that. Now, the calorie labeling in New York City has been evaluated, just in case you're interested in that's effect. Uh, we did our own study. We surveyed over 1,000 customers as they're exiting uh, the fast food chains, both before and after the rules went into effect. And we found that afterwards, about 15% of customers said that they used the calorie counts, and those that did purchase about 100 fewer calories. Um, at the same time, a group of researchers who analyzed, uh, there were a group of researchers who analyzed data from uh, Starbucks cash registers, where they had access to millions of records uh, through the cash registers. And they found on, on the average there was about a 6% calorie reduction um, <coughs> in the post period compared to the pre. But it was more substantial among those purchasing an entire meal at Starbucks. Uh, overall, you know, many people are just going to Starbucks for a cup of coffee. <coughs> there were two other smaller studies that showed no impact. And so as I put all these together, I would conclude that the calorie labeling has an effect, that it's, uh, it's a small effect, uh, and it's somewhat spotty. Uh, so this by itself is not going to turn around the obesity epidemic, but it is a contributor to our uh, efforts to try to turn around the obesity epidemic. Now let's talk about sugary drinks. This is an area we've had a lot of focus on. Uh, first, I want to give you the rationale for why we're focused on it so much. Uh, the, consum the calorie consumption from sugary drinks has risen dramatically over the decades. It's nearly tripled from the 1970s to the early 2000s. Um, at this point, we were close to 200 calories per capita per day. It's a huge amount. Uh, when you add that up, that can certainly add to many pounds per year if these calories are added to the diet rather than substituting the diet. Um, and calories from sugary drinks tend to be added to the diet. The, um, there's been, a, in parallel with the increase in consumption, there's been an increase in portion sizes. Uh, so this is uh, just data from McDonald's. So uh, when they first opened up in 1955, they had one size available uh, of sugary drink. It was seven ounces. That grew over the years. In the early 2000s, they had two sizes. They were 32 and 42 ounces. So the smallest you could get would be 32 ounces. Uh, since then, they've shrunk their, their portions. But even now, the smallest size they have is 12 ounces, and that's referred to as a child size, which you sort of have to ask extra for that. Uh, the default size is going to be uh, of the far small is 16 ounces, and a medium, and what they call medium is 21 ounces. So calorie, uh, so portions of sugary drinks are still 
uh, huge compared to what they were in the 1950s. And, and the growth in portion size has been pretty much in parallel with the growth in consumption. Now here in New York City, uh, we just looked at it uh, in this graph here where we plotted out the uh, consumption of sugary drinks by self-report uh, versus the obesity rates uh, by self-report, yeah, by self-report, by neighborhood across the city. And with, this is just a scatter plot and a regression. And, and as you can see, there's a pretty tight correlation uh, no matter what borough you're in in New York City, between sugary drink consumption and obesity. Now, this by itself doesn't prove that sugary drink consumption is driving the obesity epidemic in New York City. But when you put it together with research data that suggests that sugary drinks do increase weight gain, um, it does make you think this may be an important contributor. So we're, we're concerned about uh, sugary drinks. We want to reduce the, the consumption. We want to reduce the portions. Uh, how have we approached this here? Well, the first thing we did was uh, propose a tax on sugary drinks. And the uh, idea behind this was similar to cigarette taxes, that this would, um, it would raise the price, it would reduce the industry incentive to supersize. Uh, basically, the, the cost to put a cup of sugary drinks in front of you is pretty well fixed. So if they can sell you a larger portion for a larger price, they make greater profit. So they have uh, economic drivers that are driving this uh, supersize uh, pattern over the last 30 years. So this would tend to reduce it, that now they start to have some, uh, some losses by paying more taxes if they, uh, if they supersize. It would encourage people to switch to the lower calorie beverages, uh, so they would switch to diet, because which would not be taxed. It would also encourage people to choose smaller portions. Our estimate is that it would reduce consumption about 15 to 20 percent, because there are price elasticities that have been worked out for sugary drinks. Um, and an independent researcher in New York estimated that for the state of New York, if this uh, rule had passed, uh, it would prevent 37,000 people from developing type 2 diabetes over 10 years and save $2 billion in health care costs. Uh, nonetheless, this was something which the city couldn't do on its own. It would have to go through the state legislature, and the state legislature uh, rejected it under heavy lobbying from the soda industry. The next thing we did was we proposed um, a demonstration project with this, the Food Step program, which is... Um, now officially called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Uh, this is uh, a very large proportion of households in New York and nationwide are in this program. Um, and uh, food stamp benefits cannot be used to buy anything. Uh, they can't be used to buy cigarettes or alcohol or pet food or aluminum foil um, or prepared food. You can't use it at a restaurant. And so it would simply add one item to the list of products that you cannot use food stamps for. Uh, for New York City as a two-year demonstration project. Uh, people in the food stamp program would not have gotten any reduction in the dollar value of their benefits. They just couldn't use it for that, uh, these sugary drink items. Uh, and to me, the rationale is pretty simple. We shouldn't be subsidizing the product that is the, probably the single worst contributor to our biggest nutritional problem in the, in the country, especially in the name of a nutrition program. So we proposed it with a rigorous evaluation that sees effect uh, on how much people would actually reduce their consumption. Would they simply buy those drinks with their own money, or, or would they make a big difference? Um, and the USDA, unfortunately, rejected this proposal. So um, the next thing we tried was this, and this you've probably heard publicity around recently. Uh, we passed in the Board of Health uh, this past September a rule that deals with portion size issue. It simply says that in the restaurants that we regulate, the maximum size of sugary drinks they can sell is 16 ounces. Uh, if somebody wants to buy 32 ounces, they can get 32 ounces. They just have to put them in two cups. Um, it would apply to any beverage with it has added sweetener and also is more than 25 calories per 8 ounces. Uh, and we have just a few simple exclusions for a variety of reasons, uh, diet beverages, alcoholic beverages, dairy beverages. Um, and so it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Um, nonetheless, it's caused an awful lot of excitement and controversy around the country. I don't know if you've seen this, but this is my favorite ad. Uh, I would say most of the publicity around this has been very, very positive. It, uh, even the people who are against the rule are now talking about the fact that sugary drinks make you fat. Now, overall, we've been tracking sugary drink consumption in New York City, and we're seeing declines. <coughs> These are <coughs> declines, at least in self-reported consumption, in adults here from our community health survey, which is an annual telephone survey, and in teenagers, which is a biannual survey done uh, in high schools, uh, the youth risk behavior survey that's done all over the country. I can't guarantee that the self-reported consumption uh, reflects actual consumption, but the trend is certainly encouraging. So you know, we've done a lot of things that, uh, if you read the papers, you would think that they're very, very unpopular. 
but uh, a, a poll that was done by Quinnipiac, um, I forget, it, this was in 2010, asked people about a number of our policies specifically, and then overall asked, do you think that uh, the, uh, the Bloomberg policies on food are, have gone too far, have gone not far enough, or have gone about right? Uh, and as you can see here, 55% of people said it was about right, and another 17% said it wasn't far enough. Uh, and the conclusion is that people really like these policies. So um, I, I show this as a means of encouraging elected officials around the country who, who think that we are, um, you know, it, it's dangerous to tread in sorts of waters to say, in fact, the public likes health, they like healthy environments, they like government to be out there protecting their health, uh, and so this is a thing that they ought to consider too. So now let me just uh, finish with thoughts about uh, what are the, the roles of researchers in uh, issues like this, in population-based prevention. Uh, I would say the most important uh, thing is generating ideas that have potential population level impact. You know, most researchers in public health, I'm sad to say, do things that are focused very much on the individual level. Uh, they do little trials on 50 people or 100 people. Um, I've got a population of 8 million people I have to deal with. Uh, unless it can be scaled up to something of that size, it's of no value to me. And so, um, and it's difficult to come up with good ideas. And so, if we had many researchers around the country generating ideas, uh, many of those ideas will come by the wayside, but we'll find some real gems in the middle of them. So changes in law, changes in regulation uh, ideas, I think, are extremely valuable to us. And then we want to assess the potential impact before the such policies are put in place. And then we want to assess the actual impact after those policies are put in place. So I'm a big believer in mathematical models to estimate uh, the p potential impact of policies. They always can be challenged uh, as to what their validity, but they're nonetheless far better than having nothing. And if you do a model, you may often find that something has far less impact than you would expect, or far more. And finally, I think a, a really key role is for researchers to serve as an expert voice. When we did the, the um, <coughs> portion size rule, uh, we had a public hearing, and we needed to have people come out and speak. It was extremely valued to us, valuable to us to have experts there saying, Yes, sugary drinks are a big health problem. Yes, they need to be addressed. And yes, this sort of approach is likely to, to benefit them. So then, just in general, if you're thinking about what sort of uh, ways should you direct your research uh, time and energies, uh, I think too often researchers generate, researchers' questions are generated from previous research, where they say, well, we don't know the answer to that. Maybe let's do a research project to know the answer to that. And I would like to suggest that we should work it backwards and say, well, first, what policies and interventions might work to solve this major public health problem? Let's generate the ideas first and then work backwards from there and say, well then, given that, what are the, the information gaps that we need to fill in before we put those policies and interventions in place? Such as, as I mentioned, population impact, potential effectiveness, unintended consequences, the cost, the feasibility, community support through things like polling, um, and especially for people like you, the ability to withstand legal challenge. That's extremely important to us. Uh, you know, there's an infinite number of unanswered questions out there, but a much smaller number of questions that really uh, we need to know to put in place policies that we think will address the important health problems of our time. So to give you just a few examples of important research questions that may not necessarily be done by lawyers, but uh, that would be valuable to someone like me uh, in trying to address the obesity epidemic, uh, I'd like to know more about what are the sources of calories in sugary drinks in a place like New York City? How much of the calories that are purchased come from restaurants versus uh, food stores like bodegas or, or supermarkets or vending machines. So where we should, should be, what should be the targets of our policy approaches? Uh, how many of them are purchased at the workplace? How much, of our, <coughs> so I can know how much of our effort should be placed at the workplace. Uh, what about economic issues? The, you know, how can we project what the effect might be on SNAP consumers if we change the SNAP rules? Uh, what would, how much of their own money would be used to purchase items that are prescripted? Uh, versus uh, you know, how much they would just not purchase those items. That could be done through uh, analyzing existing data or through some sorts of simulations or, or lab experiments. Um, I'd like to know about the profitability of selling healthy food versus snack food. The uh, economic incentives drive the food system. The food system drives the obesity epidemic. If we can understand those economic incentives better, we might be able to alter them in such a way that the food system drives itself more towards, towards health. Um, so, and we just finish with the thoughts that in public health, we're thinking about mass diseases, we're thinking about mass exposures, those require mass remedies. That means policy uh, and environmental change um, 
none of that's easy. Uh, it requires people to think of what has a, a potential impact and then find those little opportunities in the law, uh, federal, state, local, where we can make a change that, uh, that actually will stick and withstand legal challenge. So uh, let me stop there and, uh, and open up for questions.